Welcome to Releasing Your Inner Dragon, where story creators talk story creation. Drake is an award-winning fantasy novelist and creative writing teacher. You can find his epic fantasy series, The Genesis Oblivion, on Kindle Vela. Marie runs a fantasy world-building channel called Just In Time Worlds, and her first book, The Hidden Blade, is available on Kindle Unlimited. We hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Releasing Your Inner Dragon with Marie and Drake. So today we're going to talk about show, don't tell, with a specific emphasis on emotional content. So the reason why we're talking about it today is because this is a very important topic. I personally struggle with including emotion in my work. I almost never do it on the first draft. It's something that I have to consciously go back and do it. And then often I find myself almost telling the emotion rather than showing the emotion. And there is an amazing book, and Drake has got the physical copy of it, so uh, he'll hold it up. And it's called The Emotion Thesaurus, which we recommend that everybody has. It is a great resource that tells you how to show emotion rather than telling emotion. There's, a, there's only a couple of things that I really feel that writers need to have at all times at their fingertips. One is, and I've pushed this before, onelook.com as the best thesaurus that you're ever going to use. I actually have the original version, which you can see that's only that thick. And now we've got the second edition, which is twice as thick. Um, highly recommend that you pick up the second edition. It just has a lot more in it. It's just expanded as far as that's concerned. But the cool thing about this is, is it's like I said, it's a list book. It doesn't tell you like much. It just lists out things. It's really kind of an idea generator. So like right here, if we look at curiosity, instead of writing the word curiosity, it gives the definition of it. It gives a whole bunch of physical signs and behaviors of somebody who physically is feeling curiosity. It gives you some internal sensations of what it feels like to be curious, some mental responses. It also, the, the things that they've expanded in this version, they go into long-term responses for this emotion, signs that the emotion is being suppressed in the person. Uh, and then it gives a list of like may escalate to. So some other kind of like related words that you might want to look up for ideas uh, may dis de-escalate to some related words. And then I really love that they added this associated power verbs, approach, ask, attract, creep, desire, examine, explore, fascinate, follow, inquire, interest, like all of these really cool verbs that are going to be the power verbs for curiosity. And that's a great, that's not in the first version. And so I really love that they've expanded this and added some things. And I think they did a great job with it. I think the number one most overlooked thing from writers is emotion. We're going to do a couple things. Marie's going to share one of her puke drafts. Now this is not edited. She literally wrote it. I think you said it today or yesterday. Yeah, today. Today in a Okay, sprint. earlier today. In a 30-minute sprint, yeah. So, yeah, so zero editing. <laughs> literally, it's not edited, not reread. We're just going to kind of go through it and, and look at some things and kind of kind of see. And I'll let Marie explain, like, her first draft. But then we're also going to share, you know, I do classes on this. So I'm going to share one of my slides from my Show Don't Tell class, which is specifically geared toward emotion. And we're going to talk about that and, and mm. kind of go over that. So first, tell us about, like, what do you do in your writing when you're writing your first draft, your puke draft? So when I write my puke draft, I, what I like to do is I like to set aside like 30 minutes to just churn out as many words as I can. Normally, I churn out around 700 words in 30 minutes. I'm like, okay, I'm going to write the scene and go. And I write action and dialogue and very brief descriptions. And those descriptions are very tally at that point, because I haven't gone and put, you know, nice prose around it. I haven't gone and gone exactly what does it feel like? What does it smell like? It's all just there's a forest, there's trees, there's rocks, you know, <laughs> like I'll come back and color in. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. So written today, kids. Written How today. How brave would you be to write something this morning and then share it with the Internet that evening? No judgment from any of you. The peanut <laughs> gallery does not get to judge. <laughs> <laughs> the scene is uh, two characters riding. So the forest smelled of summer. Birds twittered at the intrusion of two humans riding into their world. The leaves riffled in the afternoon breeze. Louis smiled at the girl at his side. 
She would be his wife in a week. He needed to stop thinking of her as a girl, but it was hard. Besides the age gap between them, there was an innocence about Serena. So we may spend the entire podcast on this one paragraph. The forest smelled of summer. That is a tell. One of the ways that I I try to teach people to recognize tells is, can you turn the sentence into a math equation? The forest equals smells of summer. So it literally is just this tell. You're telling me how the, the, the forest smells. But as the reader, I can't smell that. First of all, I live in Vegas. Our summer is a 120 degree oven that if you tried to smell anything, you would just literally fry your nose with the massive hot air that you'd be taking in. So this, this doesn't mean anything to me. So one of the things that I always teach is if you're going to turn a tell into a show, it's very simple. You just ask a question. Now that question is different for every different, there's different questions for different types of tells. So this is an odor. So we're saying the, the, the flower, the forest smelled of summer. To change that into a show, we're going to say, how does a forest smell of summer? What does that smell like? And there's a million different answers for that, and you're going to do it. Now, one of the knee-jerk reactions is to do what she did, Yep. where she's like, well, the forest smelled of summer is a tell, so I'll just do the forest smelled of blueberries and moss. That's so much more descriptive because blueberries and moss is better than summer, and it is, and it's, it's- still a tell. It's, yep, it's not ready yet, but it's, it's a step in the right direction. It is a step in the right direction. And I do the same thing when I share my um, PowerPoint from uh, my class. I actually walk through the same steps where I go, mm-hmm. well, let's just change this, but we're still in a tell. So Marie, what, what is it, how does it feel to smell or what does it smell like to smell blueberries and moss? Moss is a wet smell that you almost feel in your nostrils. Mm-hmm. It leaves a silky taste in your mouth. Mm, God, those are all great visceral descriptors. Blueberries is the smell of, is the sweet smell of pies baking Mm. and cream being poured over them. So one of the, the things that I try to encourage people to do is to actually think about the sentence structure We've talked about this before. Your subject is the most important part of every sentence. So right now we're trying to make the reason. So Marie just came up with these beautiful visceral descriptions of what blueberries smell like and what moss smells like. And and all of that is what I want to smell. That's what I want to smell. I don't want you to tell me that I'm smelling blueberries and moss. I want to feel that. So if we think about the sentence structure and we flip it around, because remember, we want the subject to be the most important part. And so I don't feel like the forest is that piece. So as an example, what I've done with moss is the scent of moss hung in the air, wet and heavy on Louis's nose, a silky taste in his throat. But I might go with something that's a little more personal. So this is narration. This is that what we were talking about in the last podcast where we were talking about Is it narration that's attached to the character or narration that's directly impacting the character? Not that this isn't impacting the character as well, because you have the, especially at the end where we've got a silky taste in his throat. That obviously is, but I don't know. So it just depends. And and none of these are wrong. None of these Hmm. are right. None of these are wrong. It's just, these are all kind of artistic differences between how you want to look at it. However you look at it, that is a heck of a lot more interesting to read than the forest smelt of summer. Yes. Look at how many words we added. We went from five words to 15, 18 words, somewhere around in there. I'm not going to count them. So that is one of the things. 20. In showing, you're always going to add word count. So you're always going to make a bigger chapter. When I first started writing, my chapters tended to be 1,800 to 2,000 words long. And we're talking 20 years ago. My chapters are now four to 5,000 words long. Nothing more happens in my chapters now than they did 20 years ago. It is just so much more showy, so much more immersive, so much more emotional. That's where the extra 2,000 words, I mean, I've doubled my chapter sizes. So some of my initial puke draft chapters will be as little as 900 words, because I know that when I come back and make them showy, that will double. One of the things that I love to do 
is play things off of each other. So since blueberries, sweetness, moss, saltiness, or staleness, or because, you know, I come from Louisiana. So my moss is rotten and stinky and decaying. And because that's what the swamps of Louisiana are like. So when you say moss to me, those are the things that I think about. I would never write the word silky and moss in the same description, because that's not how moss is in my world. So because of that, I would maybe also do a a juxtaposition. I would start with one, you know, one scent, which was in stark contrast to this scent and bring them both in, because that's also very interesting. I mean, once you've identified the tell, it's about asking those questions of how can I make this show? And there is no wrong answer as long as you're actually showing it. So you ask the question, what does it smell like? You bring that answer in and that's what we've got. So something like the sweet taste of blueberries. Sat in stark contrast to the stench of moss or the decaying stench of moss or something like that. It's only your moss that escapes. Mine smells a little musty. Okay. So to the musty sm- smell, but that's just something I like to think about. I, yeah. If I have two juxtaposition things... I like to think about, can I play them off of each other? And yes, I know technically you can't have a green smell, but moss really does smell green. I got in a lot of fights with a lot of word Nazis when I was going to writers <laughs> groups because like I actually got kicked out of a writers group 15, 18, well, I was more than that. It was probably 25 years ago uh, because there was this one woman that constantly did this and it just always irked me. And it wasn't even, I got kicked out for bitching at her about, it wasn't even me reading it. Somebody else had written something to the effect of, and this is 25 years ago, I don't remember exactly, but it was something effect of uh, the fire danced along the log in the, in the campfire, whatever he was, the character was sitting at a campfire and he was watching the fire and and he (laughs) described it. The fire danced along the, the log. And she once again came out with the whole fire doesn't dance. And I'm like, I just, I went off. I I said things that I probably shouldn't have said, but I was just so frustrated with her. And I'm like, artistic license. This is creative writing. It's not technical writing. So I don't know, musty green smell. I have no problem with that. Some other people might go, you can't smell the color green, but you just have no imagination then. That's what I'm going to say. I I had somebody say to me the other day, furniture can't groan under the weight of food. I'm like, okay, clearly you have never walked into a table that is, you know, loaded with food over Christmas because yeah, yes, it can. (laughs) Yeah, no. And that's artistic license and that's, that's painting a picture and that's, that's doing our job. So I have no problem with something like musty green smell or, or whatever. That's just my opinion. Again, we, we do a lot of opinions on this podcast. We do. They strongly held opinions, but they are strongly held. And I'm always right. (laughs) So if you disagree with me, You've got to figure out how you're going to reconcile (laughs) that. (laughs) Okay, so the scent of moss hung in the air, wet and heavy on Louis' nose, a silky taste in his throat. The sweet taste of blueberries sat in stark contrast to the musty green smell. Birds twittered at the intrusion of two humans riding into their world. Leaves riffled in the afternoon breeze. So that is definitely a comma splice because those two things have got nothing to do with each other. True. Although I, you can easily turn the second half into a clause by just riffling. Like if you just change it to an ing instead of an ed, now it becomes a clause. And it actually ties, the, the leaves are obviously riff, riffling because of the, fluttering the intrusion of the two humans. Then we come to the part that needs emotion and doesn't have it right now. Uh, which is Louis smiled at the girl at his side. She would be his wife in a week. He needed to stop thinking of her as a girl, but it was hard. Besides the age gap between them, there was an innocence about Serena. This is where we talk about all the time where you have, you're writing two books at the same time. You're writing Mm -hmm. a book in your head and a book on paper. Mm -hmm. So in Marie's head, when she wrote, Louis smiled at the girl at his side. She has all this extra information that that line gives her because she wrote all that in the book in her head. Mm-hmm. So when I read this line, I was like, yeah, but what is, what, what is he feeling there? And she was like, what do you mean? What is he feeling? He's feeling. Louis is getting married to Serena and it is an arranged marriage. It is in no way, shape or form. Is this a love match? This is 100% arranged. 
that it's not that they dislike each other, but this thing is about politics. He feels towards her that she is young for him. Now, the age gap isn't that large between them. He's 26, she's 18, so it's not an unheard of age gap. But he feels that she is very innocent for him. And he feels a little awkward about the whole situation. He feels a bit nervous about becoming her husband. He feels sympathy for the situation that she's in. She's been brought up in a very sheltered way in a normal uh, southern nobles household. And he's about to marry her and take her to the most isolated fortress in the empire, to a place where there's people of a different race who live there. That's now where she's going to live. So he's got some sympathy for the situation that she's in as well. So Marie wrote the line, Louis smiled at the girl at his side, and she feels all this stuff that, that Louis is feeling. I read Louis smiled at the girl at the side, and I just see Louis kind of smile at the girl at his side. I don't feel anything. I don't understand anything. It doesn't, not that, not that this throws me out. It's not like I go, I'm missing something. Mm. But since there's nothing there for me to miss, I don't get any of that. Exactly. So this is another thing. This is not necessarily a, a direct tell. Like that first one was mm. a direct tell. What this one what we're talking about is this doesn't convey what you think it conveys. And it also needs to be emotional. Mm. What she's trying to say here with this, you know, she would have been, she will be his wife in a week and blah, 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 blah is that he's feeling something. And yet none of this from that first part all the way even to the end, there was an innocence about Serena. None of it conveys that he's awkward, that he's a little sympathetic for her, that he's a little concerned that he's going to be the man who beds her for the first time, that that he's taken her away from everything she knows. And she he feels sorry for her for that. And also the fact that she's being forced to marry a man that she doesn't love. And, you know, he doesn't necessarily love her. And so this is where you have to, to really break into the emotion. You have to really get into it. And so kind of going back to the, to the thing that I recommended at the beginning of this, the whole uh, emotional thesaurus. So there's a lot of things that we can look up with this. We could go into nervousness. One of the physical signs are short jerky movements. Well, he's not in a situation where he's going to be doing short jerky movements or pacing. Well, they're riding a horse. They're not going to pace rapid blinking, uh, a tightness but, around the eyes. I don't think that's the kind of nervousness that he's feeling here. But as you read through this clumsiness, ooh, that that might be interesting. A lack of eye contact, ooh, that's interesting. What you're really doing with this list is you're trying to, to jog your imagination to go, how could I describe this better? And so if we flip over to um, sympathy, because he's feeling that, it's again, it's another list of different things that we can look at and different things that we might be able to do. Another thing they've done a really good job of here is they've got related words. So we could also look at flustered uh, for nervousness. We could look at flustered, insecurity, anxiety, fear, dread, doubt. Maybe we find some inspiration in those. Under sympathy, we've got empathy, sadness, love, gratitude, worry. So we could look at those and see if we could come up with some things that might, again, it's not about using the examples in the book. It's about using the examples in the book to bark the idea for you to better articulate what you think this character is feeling so that the reader feels that. So one of the things that I read as I was scanning through the list now on my phone, because I have the book on my Kindle, is that these emotions can be conveyed by standing up and sitting down, like nervousness, uncertainty, they're, they're associated with that movement. So a good way might be to say, Louis shifted on his saddle. Louis shifted his weight across the bridge of his saddle. Now, this will have an immediate effect in that his horse will start dancing a little bit under him, because that's what horses do if you like move on them. Well, there's a word I love and nobody understands. <laughs> Triple? Triple. Can, can it be... Can it be tripling? So the problem is in English, the, the word tripling means becoming three. Right. But in terms of a horse gait, it's an actual thing a horse does where they lift their legs in specific orders. <laughs> it doesn't have to be that. Uh, causing his well, the reason why I was saying is because I hate the word causing. Mm. But that's what kind of takes it back to a tell. So if, if, if you could verb that, so instead mm. like 
his horse dancing under him or whatever. Obviously, and the reason why I don't like the word causing is because when you have them as a compound sentence or as a, as a clause mm -hmm. sentence, obviously what happened in the first part of the sentence is causing yes. this. So to me, that's a little overwriting. It's just, it's, it's words that don't really add anything to, to the, to the narration. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why the word causing in that sentence bothered me because there's nothing else to have caused that you've linked yeah. it together. Okay, so Louis shifted his weight across the bridge of his across the bridge of the saddle, his horse dancing under him. You know, I might suggest doing something like Louis locked on or Louis locked his gaze onto Serena's, but immediately broke and looked out into the depths of the forest or something like that. He shifted his weight across the bridge of his saddle, his horse dancing under him. So all of these things start to now show that Louis is in this this really weird awkward moment of his life without saying Louis felt awkward around Serena. So Louis locked his, but immediately broke off to look out into the forest. You could also even say uh, you could go into like how you like to use inner monologue. We could go into Louis wanted to look her, you know, look Serena deep in her eyes, but knew he couldn't. These are all just suggestions. These aren't, these aren't the best, necessarily ideas it's all about when you start getting into this editing mode it's about thinking and and playing and mm. and going ooh, what if you know same thing with the um with the first sentence i didn't think about the two juxtaposition until you had written one complete sentence with moss and then i was like actually i now that i'm thinking about it i'd probably want to do a contrast between the two so i actually wouldn't even like write that first line i would just go with the second line the sweet taste of blueberry set in stark contrast again i'd have to bring louis into it so I yeah. have to rewrite it a little bit, but this is what, this is all just, again, it's about examples, about thinking about this stuff. So to bring in that emotion, to bring in those, uh, those things, you really do have to think about how you want to convey this information. This to me is what takes me the longest. My puke draft, like Marie, I write really fast. If I was just writing puke drafts and never editing, I could probably write a hundred thousand words a month. You know, again, these are just things to think about. These are, are different ways. There's no right answer to any of this other than and it's not even a wrong answer. Just to tell everything. It's just not a great way to write. And you're probably not going to. You're probably not going to like be that well loved as an author. Well, maybe you are. I mean, I've read some really crappy books that have, you know, 3.5 because a lot of people are like, as long as you're over three, three out of five stars, you're fine. Mm. So I read a ton of three out of five star books or 3.1, 3.2 out of five star books that sell you know, hundreds of thousands of copies, maybe even more copies than I've ever sold. Mm. They don't stick with me. They don't make me want to conti continue following. But other readers are like, no, I love this guy. He's one yeah. of my favorite writers. And that's great. So there's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, this writer is a complete telly, you know, info dump heavy, crappy writer, in my opinion. Mm. And yet he's selling more books or she's selling more books than I am. Good for them. And it's good for them. That's exactly it. It's about these are all personal decisions that a writer is making. I have made the personal decision that I want to push myself hard. I want to put out something that people take notice of, that people actually come in and go, this is kind of a cut above what I normally read. Like this is, I mean, I want to read every, I want to start reading everything this guy writes. If he writes like this, I'm really into this. That's the, that's the, my decision. My decision is I'm going to push myself hard. I'm going to make myself really think about this showy, immersive, emotional read uh, mm. that's going to take my readers on this journey. And it's, it's why I don't write very fast, even though I literally could write 100,000 words a month. And yet I churn out about 300,000 words a year, 350,000 words a year, somewhere around in there, about two full novels. So um, to get back to our emotional content, we're communicating some of it now here. Now, I don't think that one should communicate all the emotion in one go. No. So potentially, Louis smiled at the girl at this side. We've, we've, we've kind of communicated he's a bit nervous. I would probably do something like Louis locked his gaze on Serena, uh, onto Serena, but, but broke off immediately or immediately broke off however you want to do it. Really, even immediately, you don't need most adverbs can be cut, but broke off uh, to, to gaze out at the forest. At that point, I've got this physical thing. I would then probably shift into, you know, me, I would use the inner monologue, but, but yours going like, she would be his wife in a week. He needed to stop thinking about her like a girl. I don't even need to say the word girl 
because he's by saying that he needs to stop thinking about a girl means he's already doing it. So I would probably put that next. Uh, I like the fact that one of the things in the emotional Thor talked about swallowing. So, Mm -hmm. you know, maybe something like he swallowed hard, steadying his resolved and turned back his horse dancing under his, his shifting weight or something like that. Again, it's about what we talked about last time about those patterns so I just, I don't know. I just, I tend to mix a lot of different types of things in with even in sentences and compound sentences or complex sentences. I'll mix things in, in paragraphs. I definitely, as we saw in my writing uh, last podcast, there wasn't a single paragraph that was just all one thing. Mm. You know, every paragraph is constantly, I'm, I'm just doing this constant juxtaposition between all these different things. But yeah, when him, when he looks away is when I'm going to have him think about stuff. And then I'm going to bring him back to the physical with him shifting back. So like the, she would be his wife in a week would probably for me go after the first sentence between those, those two. So my thought process here is he looks at her, then he breaks off to look into the forest. He shifts his weight across the bridge. He's subtle. He's all stancing under him. Then he thinks she would be his wife in a week. He needed to stop thinking of her as a girl. Then he steadies his resolve with a swallow and he turns back to smile at her. At which point we go into her description, like what she looks like which I think does a better job of emotionally like showing, you know, that there is some nerves going on here. We don't know why yet, but there's some nerves going on. A couple of things that, that we, that I showed in the last podcast with my writing that we didn't explicitly talk about. So let's talk about them here. And if you didn't listen to the last podcast or watch it on YouTube, you should go do that. It was, it was pretty good. (laughs) Subtext and holding things back. If you just go, Oh, She'd be his wife in a week and he needs to stop thinking about her like a girl. I mean, she was a virgin, obviously. She lived herself for life, obviously. Um, he was going to be taking her away to this world that she's never been to, obviously. Like if you just pile all that information in, and a lot of writers do this. It's, it amazes me how many writers do this because they do think, oh my goodness, if I don't give all this information to the reader, they're not going to understand. And they forget that not understanding something is a driving factor to get readers to keep reading so that they do learn what they are not understanding. As so, long as they're interested, they'll right. keep reading. Lost on the face of it was not a well-written thing. Why was it so amazingly popular? Because every episode answered one question and gave you two and gave you two more questions that weren't answered. What and is going episode, on here? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's all it was. They weren't great characters. It wasn't a great story. It was pretty convoluted. What drove that was you went to work the next week and went, what's behind the door? Where'd the door come from? What is that door? How is that door? You had to turn in. And so don't fall into this trap of, oh, I mean, she's all these different things. I need to give all that to the reader so that so that they understand why Louis is nervous, Mm. like just showing him being awkward and nervous and everything like that makes me go, wow, that's interesting. Why is, why is this? I mean, it's just a girl. What? And then you start getting me this information as I go and I go, Oh, okay. That's cool. Oh, look at that. Oh, Oh. And so you slowly dole this stuff out as opposed to just, you know, feeling like you have to give it to me immediately. And Drake's going to share us his slide around emotional showing us. So yeah, I just want to kind of go over what I do in my classes as far as uh, this is just one of the slides of my show don't tell class and we're you know I'm not, I'm not even going to open it up I'm just or the PowerPoint I'm just going to do it in PowerPoint. Uh, so it's not like a slide so you can see all my other slides over here too. Really quickly because this just I feel like is going to put the the button on this. It's going to take because we we really did kind of chase a lot of rabbits. We talked about a lot of thinking different and I think this kind of will bring it down a little bit more organized than than what we did. So when I get into talking about emotions, what I try to tell people is we don't want to tell our readers what our characters are feeling. We want to show it to them. So the examples that I use, and normally you would get these one at a time. And again, I'm not doing this as a slide. So I always start off with the monster jumped from the bushes and Drake was scared. You know, I say, don't worry about the stuff in white. Let's just look at the the stuff in yellow because these aren't great. They're just used for examples. Drake equals scared. So we can turn it into a math equation. So there it is. So one of the things that I talk about in this class is you really want to use the best verbs possible. So that was a a slide earlier than this. So I always say, okay, so scared is kind of a weak verb. 
we could we might be able to to change it a little bit. It's exactly what you did with the the moss and the berries at the beginning. So Drake was terrified because terrified is a better word than scared. Still, it's a tell. Drake equals scared. Another thing we talked about was linking verbs. So was is a verb in this sentence. And so it's also weak. So we would go, oh, well, I'll do a, a stronger was verb. Drake felt terrified. No, doesn't fix anything. Absolutely a tell. So what, then what I say is what we really have to do is we have to ask that question. So this is a, a, an inner feeling. So if we're going to do an inner feeling, we would ask the question, what does it feel like internally to feel terrified? And whatever answer you come up with is going to be that, just like we talked about. So as one example would be Tara washed over Drake. I mean, yeah, Tara washed over Drake, draining the blood from his face. And the reason why I do this is because I also want to talk about overwriting. And I say, you know, to me, this is a little overwriting because sure, we could, we could write Tara washed over Drake. But if the blood is draining from his face, there's only one emotion that that's associated with for humans. He's not happy. He's not falling in love. You know, blood draining from your face always is, is our human knowledge sign of you're afraid. And so we could cut that down to just the blood drain from Drake's face. And so now we, instead of writing Drake was scared, the blood drain from Drake's face, much now you're seeing, and again, this is now external. Um, so it doesn't answer the question. And I really do need to fix that because every time I talk about this, so what I did was I took an internal feeling and I turned it into an external visual thing. But if we go to the emotional thesaurus, and the reason why I do this is so I can talk about this. So if we go to the, to the next level, and a lot of this came from the emotional thesaurus or, or I made it up or whatever. So there's other things that we could use. I struggle to breathe, Drake struggle to breathe, my eyes bulge, Drake's eyes bulge, tremors racked my body, Drake's body, the sensation of needles ran up my spine, Drake's throat clamped shut, a scream ripped from my lips, Drake's palms felt clammy. And that yes, this is a felt. And so I always talk about this. Don't fall into the trap of thinking that you're telling or showing and then throw a felt in there. I backed away, escape being my only thought, the only thought in my head. So there's all, and this is just a short list of all the different things that we can think about for turning this into a much more showy, much more emotional thing. And it just depends. Do I want to do an internal thing? Do I want to do an external thing? You know, the blood draining from my face, definitely external. Uh, escape being the only thought in my head, being internal. Screaming, external. Throat clamping shut, internal. Just depends on what you're trying to do, what you're trying to convey. There's no right answer because every one of these are going to be wrong in certain paragraphs, depending on what you're trying to push and what you're trying to accomplish. So that's why, again, I love this emotional thesaurus because it just gives you this massive list of things to think about to like, Oh, what would be the perfect way to show this moment in this story, in this character's life to have the reader feel it. And then, you know, the class goes on, but we'll be done as far as that. I just want to kind of put that button on this uh, just to kind of solidify everything we're saying. It's not that difficult. It comes down to that question. When you notice that you have a tell or if somebody tells you, you know, that, that you've gotten critique from or whatever, and they're like, hey, this is a tell. It really is just going, OK, do I want this internal? Do I want it visual? Uh, remember, secondary characters you're never inside of. So you can only do visual or what they say. So a scream ripped from his lips is fine. Bile rose in the back of his throat. No. Unless your main character is going over and sticking his tongue down that character's throat, he doesn't know if bile's in the back of his throat. Also, you're probably writing a different story than I am if you're going to do that. So, you know, you have to think about that as well. Is it a secondary character that you're trying to show? Is it a main character, the narrating character you're trying to show that you're in their head? You can do internal, external, and all that sort of stuff. So it's not that complicated if you think about it. It's just most writers, especially newer writers, just don't think about this stuff. They puke this stuff on the page. They reread it and they're like, John felt terrified. And then he was really frightened. And then he loved this girl so much that, you know, he felt like his heart was going to explode. And they're like, look at how great of a writer I am. And you're going to feel all of this. And I'm like, no, I don't. I don't feel any of that. I mean, it doesn't mean that it's not a good story. Again, there are plenty of stories. A lot of the older stories that have still stood up, you know, stood the test of time. That was during a time. Yeah when the industry that was going to pay them yeah. dictated that they wrote that way. Mm. Although I do want to say one last little, little, little quick thing. And I can't read Animal Farm because it's written in that same way. Yeah. And yet 1984 is written in limited. It was so beautiful. We're talking about in the 40s 
And it was, I, I love that book. I loved everything about that book. Not only the message and everything else, but the, I cared about the character and I was invested and I was there. Not that it's the best example of limited, but it is so much better than anything of that time that it just blew me away. So what you have to remember about Orwell is he was writing from a very different place. He was writing political social commentary. Right. He wasn't writing to entertain. No. He was writing to warn. He was writing to warn and to educate. Like right. that was what he was doing. 1984, what he could write, he needed to write from that limited perspective because he wanted to put you into the main narrator living in this repressive society. He wanted that image to stick in your head. So he didn't you, want to tell you that it was dangerous to go down this path. He wanted he to wanted show you, you to believe it. Yeah. He wanted you to feel it. Yeah. And so, but, but that's a great way to end this topic. That's a great way to end this. I, and I, we should have, it's almost like we planned that and we absolutely didn't, but this is the <laughs> absolute best. I've never even thought about it like this. Today's audience crave that level of entertainment. So it's not, we don't want to tell them about this cool fantasy world that these characters are in. We want them to feel it. We want them to believe it. We want them to be in it. Yes. And they want that too. I, I do want to say yeah. that if you in the 60s and 70s skipped over Ursula K. Le Guin. <gasps> Love Le Guin. Because she, she wrote then. She wrote in the 60s and 70s. She and did. she wrote in Limited. She did. Le Guin to me is the same thing that uh, Orwell is to the 40s. Mm. Yeah. So in the 60s and 70s, fantasy was trying to learn and this she thing. Just... And she was ahead of her time. Oh. Because, oh, my goodness. The... Oh. I've, I've read a lot of Le Guin. Like, I've read a lot, a lot of Le Guin. But I love the Earthsea trilogy. Yes. I, I love it. I yeah. love the ho I love the magic system. I love the world. I love the writing. I love everything about her. So when you're doing your emotional content, try and get hold of that thesaurus and try and make it showy, not tatty. Tons of cool imagination sparking lists that you can go through and just, oh, you know, it'd be cool. And that's why I always say, because people are like, oh, I'll read that book. I'm like, don't read it. Mm -mm. Don't do that. Because every time you go through, like with, with what we did with this, mm. most of that didn't a, a, a apply to this situation. However, I guarantee you there's going to be another situation where you're like, oh, this guy's nervous and you're going to go back to that nervous page. And the stuff that applied to this scene is not going to apply to the scene you're doing. It'll be other stuff in that list. And that exactly. list will then generate those ideas for you. Hi, guys. This is Marie from Releasing Your Inner Dragon. And I hope you're enjoying the podcast. If you're interested in more content on fantasy world building, head over to YouTube and look up Just In Time Worlds. I release tons of content there. If you'd like to check out my book, The Hidden Blade by Marie M. Mullaney, it is available as an ebook, audiobook and print book on Amazon. Thanks for listening and see you soon. Hey guys, Drake here. Thank you so much for listening to Releasing Your Inner Dragon podcast. I hope you're getting a ton of information and maybe even some nuggets of gold that you can take into your own writing to help you on your journey of story creation. A couple things I want to throw at you. First of all, for the first time in years, I am opening myself up to being a private mentor again. If you would like for me to work with you to improve your writing right now, reach out to me. You can either go to my website, maxwellalexanderdrake.com, and send me a contact form, or just email me at author at maxadrake.com. Also, as many of you may know, I've been out of the novel game for quite a few years. I was the lead fiction writer for EverQuest Next from Sony. I've been in the movie and TV industry for a few years now, but I am excited to say I'm back into the novel game. I've actually been working on a novel for a little while now, and I'm going to start dropping it on Amazon's Vela. So if you're on that platform, look me up, Maxwell Alexander Drake. Thank you again for listening, and as always, keep writing.